Hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm the second of the three Chris's of this morning, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, so yeah, just before I get started, a little bit about me. Um, I'm, a, I'm a hacker from Vancouver Island in Canada. Uh, my background is in uh, adversarial attacks against embedded security. Uh, my background, uh, my, my original entry into reverse engineering was in pay TV hacking, and I've done some work since then in bypassing uh, microcontroller read protection and, and this kind of things. Uh, usually I'm working from an attacker's perspective more than a defender's perspective. Uh, one of the past projects that I worked on was called How Do I Crack Satellite and Cable Pay TV? And I reverse engineered the Motorola set-top boxes that are used for cable, and they're also used for satellite in Canada. And that project did include optical ROM extraction and then disassembly and analysis and finding a glitch to be able to extract the keys. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the uh, ROM extraction process. Um, so why, why do we want the ROM? Um, Chris Tarnovsky mentioned uh, some of this in, in his talk. The, the chips will start up off of the uh, boot ROM, typically. So if we can extract the boot ROM and analyze that code, if we find any bugs in the boot ROM, uh, then potentially we can take over control of the chip before any user code even runs. Um, so the, the ROM is, is permanent, non-volatile data that's on the chip and is actually built into the chip as part of the manufacturing process. Uh, so no power is required for it to remain stored, and this is f physically coded into the silicon or the metal interconnect layers. Uh, the ROM doesn't require any programming by the user. This is done during manufacturing at, at the fab. So as soon as the chip is out of manufacturing, you boot it up, and it will start to run this ROM code. And again, the boot ROM is a really typical use of ROM inside of, of chips. Uh, sometimes even if the chip doesn't mention that it's running a boot ROM, there will be a small boot ROM that executes before it passes on control to your code to do some setup and this kind of a thing. Um, so the, the ROMs and especially the boot ROMs are, are very interesting to look at. Um, who's interested in reading the ROM? There's been quite a few people who've been doing this for a lot of years now, uh, including uh, pirates uh, from pay TV and video games and counterfeiting in, in general, knocking off electronics. With an industry, it's done for competitive analysis of competitors' products and to stay on top of the technology. Um, in, in general, researchers doing uh, academic research in, into security and uh, ICs. And uh, also, we've, we've seen ROM being extracted several times by uh, video game and computer archi archivists, like for the main project and this kind of, this kind of thing, archiving the old uh, video games. Uh, so what does a ROM look like? It, it can be organized in, uh, in, in different ways. Uh, in general, it's a lot of bits, and they're organized in this kind of a matrix of rows and columns. Uh, this chip right here is an uh, ST16 chip from a pay TV card from uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, this chip was delayered using hydrofluoric acid, and that removed the uh, metal interconnection layers from the top so that we actually have the, the bits pattern visible. You can see there's a, a difference whether there's a, whether you have your lines connecting here or whether you have a space. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is uh, another type of a ROM. This is from uh, an SD19, another pay TV card, actually. Um, so this chip was delayered also using hydrofluoric acid. And then after that, it was etched using a, a dash etch, which is uh, a type of an etch that will attack more specifically the uh, doped regions of the chip. Uh, this is another type of a ROM. From, uh, this is actually inside of an old XM radio. And uh, the picture on this one isn't so great, but we can see that it's this is uh, one of the metal layers. Again, the top layers have been removed with hydrofluoric acid. And then we can see the, the difference in the metal, whether it's connected or not, encodes whether the bits are one or zero. Uh, so how does the ROM work? Uh, there's different types of ROM, NOR, NAND, whether it's implant or the, the via connections. Um, for the purposes of extracting the binary data, the, per the focus of this talk, we don't need to understand the details. The whole point is that we can see the difference between the two, the two states rep representing one or zero. Um, for just extracting the binary data, typically I don't really care specifically how the ROM works. I just want to get the binary data out. So if we want to look at the ROM, how can we see it? We need a microscope. We need acid for decapsulation because the chip is always inside of some sort of a, a plastic uh, package of some type. 
So we use fuming nitric acid to uh, clean off all the, the plastic off of the chip. In, uh, in some cases, the ROM will be visible just looking at the chip. Um, typically, the ROM is encoded on a lower layer of the chip, and especially modern chips have many different layers of metal on top, so we have to delayer it. Uh, so we can use an acid, like hydrofluoric acid, will remove the oxide, and this is called wet etching. Or another option for delayering is chemical mechanical polishing, which Chris also mentioned in his talk for uh, preparing samples for use in the, in the FIB for analysis. Um, and that can be used, sometimes it's used alongside the wet etching, or sometimes it's used totally independently. Uh, so for decapsulating chips, we use the fuming nitric acid. Um, it, it's fairly aggressive and it does fume, as you can see in, in the picture there. Um, so I, I'm going to try to explain how easy some of these techniques are, uh, but keep in mind I'm not really going to go into the safety of all of it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not equipped to give anybody else safety advice or anything. Um, as, as a bare minimum for these kinds of chemicals, you need to do this inside of a fume hood where there's good extraction of the air so you're not breathing any, in any of these fumes. Um, and be very aware of the different chemicals that you work with, so keep in mind the focus here isn't safety, it's, it's just getting the data out. And uh, the nitric acid, it really does fume. Uh, as soon as you open the bottle, you'll see some fuming come out. Uh, once you heat it up, or uh, especially once it's working on a chip reacting, you get a lot of really dense fumes out of there. Um, using the nitric acid to decapsulate the chip after it comes out of this acid, it will be clean and actually a still working chip. The acid doesn't destroy the chip itself. For the purpose of the optical rhombid extraction, we don't really need the chip to actually be working. The most important part is that it's clean and we can get pictures of it. Um, so there could be some alternatives other than fuming nitric acid that might actually be usable if you're on more of a budget. Uh, but generally speaking, the fuming nitric acid is, is the best way to uh, clean the chip to get a perfectly clean and working chip. Uh, this is what a chip looks like after it's gone through the nitric acid. Uh, they come out uh, super nice and clean. Uh, you can see there's uh, the gold bond wires on these chips are still attached. The package has all been removed, so the wires are just kind of floating in the air, uh, but they are still attached to the chip itself. So not only has the, the chip been decapsulated and not damaged, but there's still wires attached. This is still fully functional, so if you have a way to attach to these bond wires, or a, a wire bonding machine yourself, then you could still run these chips, actually. Uh, so for delayering chips, um, as, as I mentioned, often the ROM bits aren't directly visible from the top of the chip, so you need to strip some layers off. Uh, so uh, a technique for delayering is to do wet edging, wet etching with hydrofluoric acid. And a little budget lab tip here, wink rust stain remover is dilute hydrofluoric acid. It works really well. Chris Tarnowski can also vouch for this. This is a, a great uh, trick that you can find off, on the shelf in the hardware store. It works great in the lab. Um, I use this uh, in my own lab, it works great. One of the other nice features of the Wink Rust Stain Remover is that it's already dilute, so you're not keeping a bottle of very strong hydrofluoric acid in your lab that to use you have to dilute anyways. Um, just a nice little, nice little bottle of Wink and uh, it does a great job on these chips. Uh, so the hydrofluoric acid inside the Wink will etch away the passivation layer that covers the chip as well as all the oxide layers that insulate uh, the different metal interconnection layers. And uh, another method for delayering is chem chemical mechanical polishing, CMP polishing. Uh, Chris also mentioned this in, in his talk that he does uh, some of his preparation uh, for the images that he gets in the, in the SEM. So this is one example of, of a basic CMP machine for polishing chips. The round plate rotates like a turntable. On the surface of the plate is a, is a disc coated with abrasive material or a cloth pad that's used along with a collodial silica slurry as an abrasive. Uh, the blue bottle in the back there is the uh, colloidal silica slurry. Uh, then a chip is mounted to a jig that holds it flat and it will apply pressure while it sits on the abrasive disc as it spins. Um, so both the technique of polishing and wet etching with a hydrofluoric acid uh, these actually come from failure analysis and even the manufacturing process for these chips. So we borrow some techniques from failure analysis, especially in manufacturing in general, and we sort of downscale this to be able to do it in a smaller scale lab for reverse engineering. So for taking pictures of chips, 
we need a, a microscope. Um, ideally, you have a, a microscope designed for wafer inspection. There, there's several different companies that make them. You can find them on, on eBay or, or Surplus for a decent, tra decent price. Uh, you'll want to have a motorized XY stage for automating the picture taking because it's a real pain to have to uh, go and uh, manually adjust the stage to, to each position when you're taking pictures. If you're taking pictures of a whole chip, it could be hundreds of tiles or more to take the whole chip. So you, you'll want a motorized stage for that. Uh, and you need a camera mounted to the microscope and you'll want very low, dist low distortion across the entire image. Uh, especially if you're stitching tiles together, then that distortion in images really messes up the uh, the end result. Uh, so this is the setup that I use in my lab for microscopes. There's two microscopes here. On the left is a Mitotoyo probing station. On the right is an Axiotron inspection microscope. Uh, the little shelf has all the controllers and light sources and, and whatnot for these. Uh, both of these pieces of equipment I bought on the used market. Um, I've been building up my, my lab for quite some time, so I have a little bit invested in this. Uh, to get into this kind of equipment, I mean, in, in this picture here, I have, you know, probably 10 or $20,000 invested into each of these microscopes, but your, your entry level equipment, you can get in at even a lower level than this. Uh, it, it, there is a tendency that once you start to buy microscope equipment, though, you'll need something more and bigger and, these days, I'm, I'm really feeling the need to have a stem beside these, and I don't have one yet. Uh, so when you're taking the pictures, the tilt of your chip is very important. Uh, when you're moving the microscope from one side of the chip to the other, your focus is going to change if the chip isn't perfectly level. And even within a single image that you're taking with a microscope, there's going to be a bit of a difference on one side of the image to the other side if the chip is tilted. One part is going to be in better focus than the other. And uh, with these kinds of problems, sometimes you can look at it and by eye, you won't necessarily see the sort of distortion. But if you try and tile all your images together to make one larger image, then uh, these focus problems will will generate repeating patterns inside of your image. So it's, it's very important that you have a, a perfectly flat chip when you're taking these pictures. Your depth of focus with the microscope at the high magnification is very, very small, like one micron. And uh, so if your chip is tilted by more than one micron, then you're going to be able to focus at some point. Uh, you need to be able to keep things clean. Um, as you work with decapped chips, you start to realize that everything everywhere is dirty, and this dirt is really trying to get between your beautifully clean chip and the microscope objective. Um, so you're going to wear gloves. Your hands are very greasy. You don't know that. Once you start working with microscopes, you realize just how greasy you really are. Uh, you need to keep the dust down. A proper clean room is really ideal. Um, but honestly, if we take some care, um, then we can actually successfully work with chips in a much more relaxed environment. Uh, we're, we're not producing wafers where we expect a very high yield. We have a little bit more room to, uh, to breathe. So speaking of that, definitely don't breathe. Exhaling on a chip will leave a lot on the surface. Um, so yeah, you, you just sort of develop some habits to, uh, to try to keep, to keep the chips as clean as possible. And again, we're not going for high yield here. We're working on single chips at a time. So if there's a little bit of dust and the chip gets dirty, then you go through a cleaning process. Uh, I'll see if I can load up this video here now. So this is just a, a video showing the, the process of, of my software that runs on the microscope. It's stitching tiles together of, uh, of the chip after having taken all of the uh, photos. As it's stitching, each one of these images is five megapixels. So you end up with quite a large image, though even this one, this is only using the 10 times objective on my uh, optical microscope. So this is not very high magnification. <laughs> and uh, Still, you end up with quite a large image, uh, not on the scale of, uh, of gigabytes at this point, but uh, hundreds of megabytes even just for, for an image like this. Yeah. <laughs> uh. 
How do I get my other window back now? Exit full screen. There we go. Okay. Um, now, how do we know what to look for when we're trying to find the ROM? Um, so to start with, we try and identify the area of the chip that holds the ROM. This is typically the most dense memory structure that exists on the, the chip, and also the overall size of this area, the number of rows and columns, should give us a, a clue. Often we have some idea of what, what size of ROM we're looking for in the number of bytes. And we're looking for indications of binary states. Um, so most of the time I, I don't need to understand actually how it works. I just want to see a difference between two states, and I can assume one is a 1 and the other is a 0. So I'll decap the chip, delayer it, take pictures, and I'll repeat this process in, until I can see that bits are visible as, as I go down through the different layers. Um, now, if I go through this process and I never see any bits, I get right down to the silicon after stripping off all the upper layers, then that could be a sign that it's an implant ROM, which you don't normally see optical. The difference is in the, uh, the transistors, actually in the silicon. Uh, so for implant ROM, there are techniques for this too. Um, now, if it is an implant ROM, then the difference between ones and zeros aren't uh, aren't visible just after delayering, but there is something called a dash etch, which will create a visible difference between the transistors. Uh, there's a, a few links here of references for for papers and uh, websites that have mentioned using this dash etch. Um, the dash etch is uh, hydrofluoric acid and nitric acid, and that's diluted with uh, acetic acid. Um, so again, as, as a budget solution for it, this technique also does work with the ink rust stain remover and nitric acid. Um, I, I did one last week using even, even a weak nitric acid, not using the fuming nitric acid. So the 69% nitric is very easy to get. You don't have to jump through any hoops like you might have to for the fuming nitric. And a little bit of the wink rust stain remover. And then that can take it from... Uh, from this, so this is uh, at 50 times magnification, and we'll zoom a little bit further. The picture's a little bit blurry, uh, but the point is we don't see any contrast between the bits here. We, we just see the white squares. Let's see if I can make the videos work again. So what I've done here is, whoops, I have a beaker of the dash etchant. So that's, I've got 15 milliliters of the uh, wink rust stain remover, hydrofluoric acid, and I added some uh, nitric acid to it. I have it heated on the hot plates. And then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this chip and I'm going to do just a very quick dip inside of the, the solution. This one is going to be timed for 10 seconds. And uh, agitate it in the solution a little bit to, to get good coverage and, and try and access the whole chip accidentally drop it and have to take it out of <laughs> the beaker. And it's about 10 seconds, so that's all right. And then after that 10 second dash etch, I saw no change at all in this case. Um, so that, that one wasn't so successful, but uh, that's all right, because I can try again. So I, I prepare the solution on the hot plate again, and I put it in a little bit longer. And after putting it in longer, there starts to be some subtle changes. It's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to see in, in this image because the contrast isn't so great, but we can start to see that there's some dark squares and some light squares. Uh, so if we play with the contrast a little bit, it shows up a little bit more clearly. And uh, this, this is still not a, a super clean image, but it's enough that we can start to see the bits, so it can give us a feeling that we're going to be able to extract the data out of this if uh, if we try hard enough, if we're focused enough on it, and if we clean it up, and we spend some time analyzing these bits. Um, another photo of another chip that's been cleaned up a little bit better and imaged a bit better, and uh, yeah, we, we get quite good contrast here, and and this is this chip is now possible to read these bits. Um, after some more adjustments and tiling some together, I mean, we, we can see on the larger image here, especially with the black and white uh, contrast like this, it, it's quite easy to, to go through this at this point and be able to see all, all of our ones and zeros. 
Uh, so this, the scale of, of chips is shrinking, um, and optical microscopes are limited in magnification. There's only so high you can magnify before we're getting below the wavelength of light, and optical doesn't do anything for us. So at that point, we need to start using scan, scanning electron microscopes. Um, also related to that is a focused ion beam, which, which works in, in a similar way, gives you the same sorts of black and white images. Um, now, if you're using a SEM or a FIB, now there might be some additional sample preparation requirements. You might have to do some coding of the chip or, or otherwise, uh, because in, in the SEM and the FIB, whether the material is conductive or not determines whether you're going to get a good image out of it. So it adds a little bit more in the preparation, um, but the magnification and the quality you can get is absolutely incredible. So the, this is a, an image from the SEM, which I, I think I got from Chris, actually. I should have put credit on there. If you see some images in here, they're from Chris Tarnofsky. Um, but we can see here the, the bits, great contrast on them. The, uh, the black and white, I mean, it's, it's practically digital already, right? A, a good quality SEM image like this, it, it feels like the bits almost extract themselves. The, the contrast is really so great. Uh, now, this is a, a part of a ROM that was, fo that was imaged using the focused ion beam, also by Chris Tarnowski. Uh, so we can see here the, the shape where it's in, in kind of a plus sign here. Uh, this is because all of the black areas are the oxide layers that aren't imaged with the FIB. Um, so the gray areas that we can see are where Chris has gone over with the FIB and deposited platinum on top of the chip uh, so that the, the platinum will we'll let the focused ion beam be able to, to see the, the contour on top of the chip, give us, give us a bit of contrast on it. Um, so we can see the, uh, the outputs from the ROM are near the bottom there, and uh, as the, the top part of the, uh, the plus sign there, we can see some little white circles inside of, our, uh, inside of our structure here, and those white circles are indicating whether the bit is a 1 or a 0. Uh, so this contrast isn't quite as nice as the previous SEM image, um, but on here also, I mean, we can we can discern the difference, so we're going to be able to extract the uh, digital data. Uh, for the bit extraction process, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the bits from the image, and we're going to create a file of ones and zeros. Uh, the in the first step, we're just going to extract the data into uh, a matrix of ones and zeros, uh, not organizing into bytes yet. Uh, this part can be done manually uh, and crowdsourced. Like the main pro main project has done this a few times. Um, the the trick with this doing it manually is that there's a lot of bits inside of a ROM. If you have a ROM that's 32 kilobytes, you're looking at 260,000 bits. So that that's quite a lot to do manually. Crowdsourced can make it uh, practical. Or uh, another option is to use an automated bit extraction software. Uh, so there's an open source bit extraction software called Rompar. Uh, there, there's not a lot out there as, as far as open tools, so this is very cool that, that something like Rompar ex exists. Um, for my own project here, I've, I've made my own kind of primitive tools that, that fit my own uh, workflow. Uh, so this is a screenshot of uh, the extraction tool that, uh, that I use. Uh, so the large window on the right is showing a photo of the ROM. It has a graphic overlay displaying which bits have been identified as one or zero by the software. Uh, the window at the top left is where I put status messages and I sort of keep some very brief instructions there so that I can walk myself through the process. Uh, the middle window has the different settings that, that the bit analyzer is using. Um, the, the basic process that I'm using here is I look on a grid, all, all of the bits are organized into a grid. So I look on a grid and I'm checking for light spots or dark spots. The, the threshold of the brightness is the, the main feature that I used to look at. I have a couple other analysis options, but generally speaking, you're going to end up with something where you're going to have a light spot or a dark spot to encode a one or a zero. And then the bottom window is just an image histogram for, uh, helping to, uh, see that your pixel values in your, your, uh, your different uh, processing that you can do to the image is, is giving you an, an optimal image to work with. Um, so sometimes the software isn't successful at identifying whether a bit is a 1 or a 0. Um, so what I do is I have a threshold set. So if it's certain it's a 1, it will mark it in a yellow color with a, for the light boxes. Or if it's certain it's a 0 or a dark one, it'll mark it with a blue box. 
And if it's something in the middle, then it'll mark it with a red box so that I can manually go back and, uh, and determine how it should be actually set. Um, so I can then also adjust the, uh, the transparency of this overlay. When I make it more transparent, you can see in the background a little bit more. Uh, so we can see at the left side of that ROM photo, there is one red box. Um, so inside of the software, I can just move the mouse over top of that box and I can press a one or a zero and I can set that bit to the specific value. Um, having the overlay like this also lets me get a, a visual idea of how the bit extraction process is working and fine tune the, uh, the settings sort of in real time as I'm going through the images. Uh, after extracting the bits, then we're going to need to decode them into bytes. So I made another primitive software tool to aid in this. Each of the bits is organized in columns, like your, your, your bits zero through seven, you'll have uh, eight columns. And uh, each one of those will have its own output, right? Because all we're always reading in, in parallel. We're not reading one bit at a time, we're reading one byte at a time. Um, so generally we, we can see how many bits the ROM is outputting. Um, sometimes there can be two sides interleaved. Sometimes they'll have two halves mirrored. You know, there, there's some different ways that they can manufacture and, and do the layout. Um, the addressing is typically incremental, uh, meaning that the, uh, your, your low address bits, the, they're either organized running from left to right or right to left. And the high address bits are generally going either top to bottom or bottom to top. Um, <laughs> Typically, a ROM is organized in a very straightforward manner, actually. Uh, so how do we know when we do get the bits ordered correctly? Uh, lots of time in ROM, there's ASCII text. Uh, so if we start to see ASCII text and we can read it, then this is a pretty good sign that we have the bits organized into bytes correctly because it, you know, it's making sensible data. Uh, we might also see some patterns in, in data tables or there might be some known constants. And then uh, the third method is to actually try disassembling it. And if you can disassemble the code and it comes out to something sensible, then you're going to have the bits in, in the right order, and that's good. Uh, so here's a screenshot of the, the software that I use for decoding the, the binary data into uh, bytes. Uh, at the bottom is a labeled image of uh, ROM. This is another SEM photo from uh, Chris Tarnovsky. Um, so on this example, this is a 32-bit chip. Uh, the bits are organized in a sequential order. Bit 31 is on the left, bit 0 is on the right. Also, we can see in this picture at the bottom, there's a large area where all the bits are, are set in one direction. There's a large area that's it's all going to be FF or 00, 0 at the bottom of the ROM. Uh, so when we see these solid patterns like this, this is a pretty good indication that this ROM probably isn't encrypted, because if it's encrypted, you'll see some other kind of pattern or, or more randomness when you when you see these large clean blocks probably you're working with a ROM that's not encrypted, and once you get the bits in the right order, you're, you're going to have a good uh, binary. Uh, in this case, uh, once we organized the bits into bytes, there was a string of ASCII text with the manufacturer's name. Uh, that was the only ASCII text we found in the ROM, so thanks for putting that in. Uh, that's, that's not the first time other chips that I've looked at, the only ASCII text you find is a copyright notice. Uh, keep putting those in, that's great. <laughs> So this is a this is a video of the uh, the bit viewer program. Maybe what's going on? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so I've I've loaded in the the file that I've made of ones and zeros extracted from the uh, photo, and now we can we can see them uh, just as a you know graphic image here, white squares or black squares. Um, so inside of the software, I have uh, some different options for how it's it's exported for the the bit order and this kind of thing, and then there's also a window I can bring up that shows the. Uh, shows the hex values of uh, all the bytes inside of there. Um, so as I change options inside of the software, I get a live update of my hex view. So I can look at the bits, I can try and organize them in different ways, and I can very quickly see inside of the hex view if I start to see opcodes that I recognize, or ASCII text, or anything like this. 
Um, also, within the software, I have some of the different options, like I can click this uh, set bit here, and I'll adjust the window just so that we can see both of these at the same time. And uh, now if I click on some of the bits within the, the matrix of bits, we can see in the output values change. Like right now, the byte zero is changing, the byte one is changing, and we're just flipping one bit at a time. So as we flip bits in the image, we can see where that corresponds to actually on the, uh, on the binary uh, hex view itself. Um, this is also nice if you have dirt on the chip or you know that your extraction wasn't perfect, then you can get an idea of actually which part of your, uh, which part of your data is likely to be correct or incorrect. And as we click in different areas, you can see different bytes of that hex view start to change. So an example of, of doing the, uh, the processing for extracting the ROM, this is an ST19 smart card. This is a K7 series card. Uh, this is the ACOS 5 smart card. You can uh, buy them to load your own programs in, this kind of thing, find them on eBay. Um, the same series of chips is used for other secure applications, including pay TV, banking, this kind of thing. So the chip will be de decapsulated using fuming nitric acid and then delayered using hydrofluoric acid. And I did the imaging with my uh, Zeiss Axiotron optical microscope that I showed earlier. So this is the chip just after decapsulation. Um, there's not much that's actually visible because this chip has a shield layer on the very top. This shield layer, when we zoom right in, looks like this. So there's a metal line that snakes around, these other lines that carry ground on them, and uh, if you disturb this, then the, the chip will stop running. Um, for the ROM extraction, I don't care if the chip is running, but I want to be able to see below, and this is blocking the view. Um, so then we etch it in, in Wink. I'm going to actually skip this video. It's basically the same as the dash etch we saw. It's a beaker on a hot plate, and you put the chip in. Um, one detail about the etching in the... Uh, the hydrofluoric acid is that as it's etching away the material on the chip, it will first be removing the passivation from the top of the chip, and then at some point it's going to expose the aluminum metal, and once that hydrofluoric acid hits the aluminum metal, then it starts to react more vigorously, and you'll actually see a lot of bubbles come off the surface of the chip. So as you're sitting in, in front of the uh, hot plate with the chip watching it being etched, you can get a pretty good visual idea of whether you've actually etched to the next layer of the chip or not, just based on did you see this big stream of bubbles coming off. Uh, so this is the decap chip, and then after dipping in hydrofluoric acid, this is the view that we get. So there's a couple spots with a little bit of dirt on this one, uh, but generally the shield came off fairly well. Uh, so we can start to see a little bit of what's below. At this point, it's still not very clear. Our image isn't very great, and that's because I stopped the etch immediately after removing the metal shield layer. So there's still a layer of oxide below the shield, above the rest of the chip. If we zoom in on that, then we can see the pattern that we see here isn't actually the metal lines. The pattern that we see here is the traces of the metal lines left in the oxide. We're, we're seeing the, the contours left over from the metal lines in the oxide. Um, so in, in some cases, this can be interesting for, for other attacks against the chip because now we can see below, but we also have the reference from the top of the chip so we could see exactly what areas the shield lines cross. Um, for the ROM extraction, we just want to go from this to get something that looks a little bit, uh, a little bit better. So after putting it back in the hydrofluoric acid to remove some oxide, it comes out looking like this. So this is a lot nicer, much more contrast. Um, one note, you can see a little circle on, on the bottom there, that bottom rectangle, bottom right, that is the ROM of this chip. And that circle isn't actually uh, damage to the chip. That's just a little bit of residue from after cleaning the chip. And so I, after dipping in hydrofluoric acid, I clean the chip in isopropanol and let it dry. And that's just a little bit of residue from it drying. Uh, so before I etch it again, I'll clean it and that will be removed. So it won't actually cause any permanent damage other than just, you know, a little showing up a little bit in, in the photo. Uh, so after this, I'll put the chip back in HF. I mean, we can't see any bits or anything yet. They're still down lower. So a couple more minutes in the hydrofluoric acid. Uh, we've stripped away another layer. Uh, there's still, there's still more metal layers that we can see. Inside of the ROM, you can see a, a few little spots there. Those are areas where the acid has pooled and etched a little bit deep. So I don't have a perfectly clean delayering at, at this point. The deeper that you go with the wet etching, the more difficult it is to keep it perfectly level. 
Uh, so one solution for that is to do a combination of wet etching and uh, polishing to keep it planar. Uh, in this case, I'm just doing the wet etching. Uh, so this is a close-up of one of those holes. Uh, but we can see where it's etched deeper. But where it's etched deeper into the next layer, we can start to see some of the bits. These are the bits encoded on the next metal layer. Um, so it's a shame that it's not going to come out perfectly even, but this is a good sign that we're going to be able to see the bits. We can see it already. So after this, I'll do another dip in the hydrofluoric acid to remove the rest of the remaining layer, and then that will expose all of the bits. So this is the full raw area of the chip that's been imaged. The differences in, in color are just from stopping and starting the process of taking pictures with a microscope and some differences in, in lighting. Um, we can see the holes have gotten a little bit larger, but there's still a relatively small area of the, of the ROM. So there's a couple ways we can deal with this. Uh, the first is there's a lot of ROM there and maybe the holes aren't even in an area that's important. So we might be able to just say, well, we're going to ignore that. Or another option is that we'll do this process on the first chip and we'll repeat the same process on a second chip and neither they, they both may come out with holes in them, but they're probably going to be in different spots. So you can actually piece it together and get a, a perfectly clean image like that. Uh, so if we start to zoom in on the ROM, as we zoom in more, we, we start to see more detail with it. We'll just keep zooming in further and further. We can, uh, we can see it. The bits are encoded for whether there's these little metal shortcuts here or not. And as we get zoomed right in, uh, it's a little bit blurry because of the, the zoom level and, and the microscope photos, but it, it's plenty good enough that we can see the contrast to see whether there's actually a bit there or not. Uh, so another example, this is uh, XC420061. This is from a previous project that I did on uh, cracking the satellite and cable TV boxes. Uh, so I went through the same process with this. This is a decapsulated chip showing the top metal layer. After going through the uh, hydrofluoric acid, it's removed that top metal layer. The bits still weren't visible at this point, so I'm going to just continue with it. After another dip in the hydrofluoric acid, it's removed even more metal. Um, at this point, I still wasn't seeing any bits, so back into the hydrofluoric acid, keep going. And then at this point, the etching is getting a, a little bit more uneven, but I started to see some ROM bits. And uh, then in this case also, I was lucky that the... Uh, the way the chip is manufactured, the ROM bits, these ones aren't encoded on a metal layer. So even though the etching was uneven, I was able to, uh, I was able to extract the full ROM because I could strip off the entire metal layers. Um, so this is the image that I got off of this chip for, for the ROM. The bits are encoded whether there's a black dot or not. Uh, the pictures came out really nice and uh, nice and clean, so it was very easy to uh, extract the data from this. Uh, if we look at the end of the ROM area, we can see that everything's in a repeating pattern. That's because they had more ROM capacity than they used for the code on this chip. So they filled the last area of ROM. In this case, they filled it with a two-byte opcode, uh, an infinite loop opcode. Uh, so it's a repeating pattern all the way through. It's, the, the pattern is, is because we have two bytes repeating over and over. Uh, but at the very end of the ROM, the pattern breaks. And that's because this chip has your reset and interrupt vector addresses right at the very end of ROM. Uh, so we can actually see at the very bottom row there, where the black dots are in a different pattern from the rest, that's the actual interrupt vectors being encoded on this chip. Um, so we're going to get bit errors when, when we do this, right? It's not a perfect process looking at the pictures and extracting the data. But uh, lots of time that, that's all right. It, it's good enough. Um, there's a, some ways to solve it, like if we have the time, we repeat the process on multiple chips, and uh, that allows us to you know, correlate the different results and, and get a good, uh, a good final binary. Uh, there's a balance of, of your time and money spent versus the, the results. Um, but a lot of the time, even with the bit errors, it's still enough that you're able to properly analyze the software and then through the analysis of your software that has some errors in it, maybe you're going to be able to find a way to extract a better copy of the ROM through, through a digital method. Um, also for the bit errors, some of the errors are really obvious when you're analyzing the software. Um, so some of the errors aren't really a problem because you'll be looking through it in a disassembler and you'll see that this instruction doesn't make sense, but if I flip one bit, it makes perfect sense. So that was probably going to be a bit error. Um, so this is the, the results from uh, the, the DigiCypher chip. 
I did the optical extraction of the ROM. I analyzed the ROM. Using that, I was able to find a technique that I could glitch into the chip and get code execution on the chip. And then I had the chip dump out its memory. So then I was able to compare the exact ROM contents with the optically extracted ROM contents. And in the picture, I've marked with red squares every bit that I had an error on. Um, so out of 260,000 bits, there were 105 errors. Only one byte had more than one bit flipped in it. So usually when you have an error, it's going to be a one bit error. Um, the error rate w was quite good. You can see some of the errors are, are clustered, you know, because of dirtiness or, or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was perfectly fine for being able to analyze and, uh, and proceed with the rest of the work. Uh, so my advice when you're trying to do the ROM extraction, it's good if you're doing the whole process yourself. Uh, because there is a balance between how good your imaging and delayering of the chip is and how easily the bits can be extracted. Uh, so if you have different people doing the uh, lab work versus the analysis work, uh, the people doing the lab work are going to see some sort of contrast in the bits and they're going to say it's good enough. And the people doing the analysis are going to say it's not 100% perfect, go back and do it again. Uh, but when you're doing it yourself, you really get a feel for the trade-off. Or do I want to spend another day working on trying to get better images of this chip, or do I spend a few hours instead on just trying to extract the bits? Um, so inside of the lab, what do we need? We need the chemicals for the decapsulation, uh, the microscope and camera, as I mentioned. Uh, for delayering, more acids, possibly uh, a CMP polisher. Another delayering technique that can be used is the uh, reactive ion etching. I didn't get into that here, really. Um, but depending on, on the scale of what you're doing and your ambition, th this can be done in, in garage. Like, my uh, my home lab is is in my, my shop on, on my property at home. Uh, the difficulties in, in trying to do the extraction process. The, the delayering is tricky. You, you don't ha necessarily have a lot of precise control for how much material you're removing from the chip, especially when you're wet etching. Um, so there's a little bit of an art to trying to get your temperature and your timing and everything exactly right. Um, also, if you're working with an implant ROM, now you have to do another set of etching after you've done the delayering, so that adds a, another place where, where you might have to tweak it a little bit. Um, and then the biggest difficulty that, that I run into now is the feature size, because the technology is just so small that in my lab with optical microscopes, I'm not able anymore to see the feature size of, of some of the, the smallest chips. So that means you have to process the chip and then get it imaged on a, on a SAM or a FIB or something like that. Um, ROM might be encrypted also, so that could be an issue. Depending on the ROM, uh, it, it could be a problem. Lot, lots of the ROM encryption isn't very strong, so lots of time that's not a real huge issue. Um, so here's an example of, of a chip that has a couple of issues. So one, the, the first issue is that I was delayering using a hydrofluoric acid and it came out very uneven. And the second issue is that the, the size of it is so small that this is the best photo that I could get with a microscope. And we can, we can sort of see some patterns that let us know that there are bits there, but we're not going to be able to see it well enough here to actually be able to extract the bits. So this would have to get delayered again and done in SM. Um, so yeah, again, the ROM encryption, it's a thing, but it might be a problem or it might not. Lots of the ROM encryption is really terrible. Um, You'll be able to download these slides if you want links to any of these. So I've got some links for some extra resources about this sort of, uh, about this sort of work. Rompar is another interesting tool to, to check into. Um, some different examples of, of optical ROM extraction you can find online. Some of these blog posts are, are really quite nice. Um, great descriptions of, of how they, they did everything. And, um, yeah, other, other places we might see bits. This is an image of a CD. So you're probably not going to want to uh, listen to your music like this. It'll take a while to extract the bits, but we, you know, it's essentially the same process as reading a ROM, really. We, we can see the, the lands of the pits. Um, or you can also get a scarf from, from Knityak, and they actually knit the, uh, the binary pattern into the scarf. Um, so you can download the, the binary file for this ROM, and you can actually go 1010, and you can see that it does match the actual pattern on the uh, scarf. Um, so yeah, if you want to download the, the slides for this, I had to go through it fairly quick. There's a link to download the slides. Also, I, I've put the, uh, the tools that I use for the bit extraction and the decoding online. Um, there is source code. It's written in C++ Builder 6, so probably nobody really wants to work with that today. Uh, but it is there if you want to play with it or, or check it out or, or whatever. I, I'd be interested in any feedback on that. Um, and I think that's my time.